Oh, good morning, Dr. Deo Hatfield. Uh, welcome to our online service. Um, I'm glad you guys could join us today. Um, yeah, man, um, it's good to be with you. Um, so we're about to go into my personal favorite time of the service, which is the worship. And I really invite you guys just to join in with us. And uh, yeah, let's worship our, our king. Eh?
How could a wretch become your treasure? The love of God has changed my destiny.
Great, what an awesome time in worshipping together. I know that these times are for us so crucial as a church, just to engage still, even online, but worshipping together as a church, it is awesome doing that. I want to invite you once again to just uh, take a few moments and mingle if you're in your home this morning with your family or if you're alone streaming, uh, take your attention towards the chat box online, maybe send a few stuff that you've been doing, but let's take a good minute to mingle. In this season as a church, we are spread amongst many homes, but we still have one unified purpose and vision. And so, as we do every Sunday, we take a moment and we champion and just sit around the value once again of generosity and giving. I really believe that God has placed this church with such incredibly generous people. And we believe as a church that God has challenged each of us, He's entrusted us with resources and called us to be faithful stewards of them. And that asks that we have our heart in the same place that the heart of Jesus, and that is in His local church. Every week in this moment, we also celebrate with uh, some of our partners as we fill in our praise reports. And just want to read to you from this one. One of our partners says, um, finally, and this is the praise, the thank you, being part of a church, meeting new people, being in community, and growing closer to Jesus. And I just love this. These are the kinds of stories that we champion as a church. People becoming part of a family, going on mission together, growing closer to Jesus. This is what we do. And it's enabled by all of us being faithful together in our generosity, stewarding our finances. So in this moment, if you haven't made the jump yet to electronic giving, it's the perfect season to do that. So if you need the bank details, if you want to use Snapscan, any of the other giving methods, you can go onto our website and find those. They are provided. Um, but also then in this moment, every week we're going to just take a moment to hear from some of our own people what they are getting up to in the season. So let's do that together. Hello, beautiful people. It is so good to be seeing you guys on the chat and as we do church in a slightly different way for the moment. And we just wanted to let you know that we cannot wait to see you again in person. We love you and we miss you. you. Must stay blessed and stay safe. From Team Dimas. Hey guys! <laughs> we hope you're having as much fun as we are during this lockdown period. <laughs> we miss you guys lots and look forward to seeing you soon. Bye! Bye. <laughs> Hi hey everyone. Baba's here. We may be separated, but thank God for the technology that all brings us together in such a fashion. Looking forward to congregating again. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Well, good morning, Doxido Hatfield. On this amazing Easter weekend, on Resurrection Sunday, as we are all still in our homes and yet together in spirit, can I ask us once again to open up our Bibles together to the book of Romans and as we finish off our series once again in verse 31. So in 1953, a uh, so Edmund Hillary, he was this very famous New Zealand mountaineer. He became the very first person to scale the highest peak on our planet, Mount Everest. And in general, he was an interesting man, no doubt. But there is this quote attributed to him, a saying where he said, mountaineering is very much like life. Never look down. Now, I can imagine that if you are scaling one of the highest 
possible points on our planet. Uh, it's good advice never to look down. But in our series, we've been taking almost a different approach. We've been saying that as we are scaling up one of the highest points in the Bible, it's this portion of scripture that theologians and, and church historians and pastors and just Christians of all stripes and ages over the ages have said that if there were to ever be a high point in the Bible, it would be this, Romans chapter 8, because it gives us the most clear and illuminating view of the gospel, the, the good news of Jesus. It gives us the clearest view of who God is and what he's done in Jesus for us. That's why Martin Luther would call it the clearest gospel of all. And as we've been hiking up this clear mountain top, we've been saying, maybe a bit differently than Sir Edmund Hillary, we've been saying that we are not going to not look down because that means we will ignore the circumstances of our life. We will ignore the emotions that we face. And the fact of the matter is that every single Christian, we wrestle with those two things. We wrestle with our emotions. We wrestle with the fact that our emotions ebb and flow as we go through difficulties, but also the circumstances of our lives. We wrestle with the fact that sometimes life deals us a very difficult card. Can anyone in our country, in the world at the moment, ignore that? And sometimes life goes exactly the way that we want it to. And yet we cannot be driven by these two things. We can't be caught up in, in emotional thinking or circumstantial thinking. Now, Paul is saying what he wants to do as we hike up this high hill of Romans chapter 8 that we would find atop it the most clear view of God and we would be promoted in a sense to gospel thinking, to good news thinking. It's where we're not ignoring or denying our emotions or our circumstances, but we are rising above them to a higher perspective. And so today we want to finish off our series on Easter weekend by looking at the final question that Paul asks. So, when I was much younger, I was just a little boy, uh, my parents had a palisade fence around the pool that was in our garden. We were not allowed to go in. I couldn't swim yet. And this one day I was playing with my tennis ball outside and accidentally threw it over and it lands in the pool. And I had developed, maybe as a child, you had a similar uh, technique. I had developed a bit of a technique where I would literally clamp onto the palisade fence with my toes and I would climb over it so I can get my ball. And I do this in this day and I see the ball is actually in the middle of the pool and so I take that little scoop that you use to get all the junk out of the pool and as I'm trying to get to the ball it's floating away from me further and further to the to the middle of the pool and I'm I'm just extending this little scoop further and further and at one point it's so heavy on the other side that my little frame can't hold it and so the next moment I'm actually in the pool the weight of the scoop pulls me right into the swimming pool and I panic I'm I'm absolutely caught off guard and I just see the water rising above my eyes. And the next moment as fear kind of settles over me, the next thing I remember is I'm standing outside of the pool, holding onto the palisade fence, crying out. I'm drenched with water and I'm crying out to my parents. It was such a horrific moment, nearly drowning in a pool. But similar, I think, to any other child in that moment, the the emotion that came over me was this deep sense of separation. I was separated from everything that brought me comfort and joy and made me feel secure. I was separated from my parents and separated from everything that brought me a sense of security. As Paul is landing in this moment, in Romans chapter 8, the thing that he is trying to combat is when life and the circumstances of life, when everything around us is, is falling apart, when my life is burning down as it were, it's so easy to have a sense of separation from God. God, are you still there? Have you forgotten me? Are you still good? Are you in control in some way or fashion? And Paul says, I want to come encourage you with something that's elevated to the truth of who God is. So for the final time, let's read together Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Paul says, what then are we to say about these things? In other words, the gospel. If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? 
Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more, he has been raised. He's also at the right hand of God and he intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we've been saying, you have to just say amen at the end of that passage. It's so powerful to reach that summit and find the truth. And we've been saying in the series that the key to understanding this passage is verse 37 and verse 38, where Paul says, we as Christians, as Christ followers, we are more than conquerors. The Greek there is literally super conquerors. How? Because we can find ourselves through him who loved us. We are found not in a love that we initiated, that we just kind of conjured up, but we are found in a love of a God who reached out to us. It's his initiative to us in Jesus that is so precious. That's what holds us. And from that, then Paul says, I am persuaded, I'm convinced, maybe your Bible says, that nothing under heaven or above can separate me from God. And it's that process of maturing of being discipled through the word and the spirit and the people of God day by day, decade in, decade out, with this thought that I would grow in my persuasion, in my conviction, being more and more convinced of the mountaintop truth of what God has done in Jesus Christ. A Christian is not someone who simply one day flips the switch and they're perfectly convinced. No, We'll see today even that Paul wrestles with the fact that life can sometimes be so incredibly difficult, but especially in this Easter time, it's a moment where we are elevated in life. We are elevated in our thinking to the high mountain top, where we don't ignore our emotions or our circumstances. At this moment, there are so many things to be aware of in both those elements of our life. And yet, Paul says, it's when I'm convinced more and more that there is a greater truth. I don't ignore the truth at the bottom of the hill or the mountain. So Edmund Hillary saying, don't look down. No, we do look down, but we look after that to a higher truth and say, God, you've placed us atop an unshakable foundation called the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so at Easter, it's not about our performance, what we can do, our track record. It's what Jesus has done. And so then, when the reality of opposition comes, when the sting of accusations enters into my heart, when the emotions of condemnation come to me, or even today, when I sense that separation, I can know nothing can change the truth of what God has done. No, in Easter, it is death to life in Christ forever. That is the truth. So let's unpack our scripture then for this morning and and look at what Paul says finally, this fourth question that he asks in this passage. He says this, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, what can separate us? Paul says a super conqueror, a conquering Christian is not someone who is just, you know, upbeat and they've got everything together. Their life is just going the way they want it to. All their emotions are in check. Everything is hunky-dory all the time. No, Paul is saying a super conqueror is someone who is convinced of the fact in every circumstance and emotion of life that nothing can separate them from the love of God. That's a love that we find in Jesus. On Resurrection Sunday, we are reminded of the victory of God. So how do we get to this conviction, to this 
this absolute understanding. And Paul says there are two things that we have to wrestle with. The first is this, if I'm going to be convinced of, if I'm going to be persuaded of the fact that nothing can separate me from God, I have to know firstly that I have been unified with God in Christ. That I have been unified, united with God in Christ. Listen to what Paul says in verse 35. Read with me. Highlight this first question. He says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? What can separate us? Paul asks, when life deals me a difficult card, when there is rejection or poverty, when, there is, um, when I'm laid off of work, when I'm stabbed in the back emotionally by someone close to me, when these things happen, when a coronavirus epidemic hits our world, And I've been so convinced emotionally on my circumstances. God, I feel separated from you. Where are you in this moment? Paul says we can be convinced why it's the love of God that has united us. Not just brought us close. Not just brought us into a proximity of God. But it's actually united us with God. You see, religiosity, as we would often say here in Doxodeo, Religiosity is this idea that if I just do enough Christian things or religious things, if I just pray enough, give enough, go to church enough, if I just try and be a good person, if I just you know, get my act together and be an upstanding moral character, if I do enough of that, then God will love me. Then he will accept me. Then he will bring me into his good graces. That kind of religiosity, it thrives on two things, distance and delay. It thrives on distance and delay. When I was busy with my postgrad studies, at one stage, we were partnered up with one of our other classmates, and we had to do a mock coaching session with this person over Skype. And so I was partnered up with a, a good guy up in North Africa. He's such a, such a colorful character. I really enjoyed him. But the first time we, did, we had to do this mock coaching with one another, I phoned him up over Skype, and as it started, within seconds, I realized this is not going to work because I would say something and then just wait. And 10, 15 seconds would pass, and I'm like, does he hear me? And I would say something, and as I say it, then he starts saying something because finally the signal's gotten there or something's happening, and then we'd speak over one another. We would laugh and just realize this is not going to work. The distance and the delay made it impossible to communicate. And it's the same way in religion. It's the same way with religiosity. There's always distance. It's always saying God is just on the horizon. If you can just do enough, if you can just give enough, be good enough, you know, come to church enough, pray enough, chant enough. If you can just do enough, you will close the gap. But then the moment you get there, God is, he's away again. The distance is there again. You never feel secure. There's always separation. There's always a question as to where God is, but there's also delay. That relationship is never there. It never takes full grasp of your heart. It's always saying, well, you lived pretty good this week. Who knows? You did well. You read your Bible. You did some good things. But who knows? Maybe next week that changes. And so there's delay. Maybe then we'll see God is still not in close proximity to us. Maybe you still have not gotten into the good graces of God yet it tires us out. And just think of how different that is from what the good news gospel of Jesus says. Not that we have done so many great things that we've closed the gap. No, it says that God, the God of the universe, the gracious and truthful and holy God, He has made a conscious decision to come and not just be close to us, near us, but to actually come and be united with us in Christ, to live within us, to make his residence in us. God is not just deliberating at the moment, still wondering, well, I wonder if I'm going to accept them. I wonder if I'm going to you know, fulfill my promises. There's not this big arm wrestling going on in heaven between God and the angels, you know, will I, will I, won't I? No, God has made the decision to come and make his residence within us through his spirit, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I love how Jesus is so convinced of this. In John 14, he writes to his disciples and he says to them, don't let your heart be troubled. 
And you can say, well, Jesus, that's easy to say in your circumstances. How can we not be troubled? But listen to what he says, why? He says, because I will not leave you as orphans. Verse 18 says, he's speaking about going back to the Father. And yet he says, I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I will live and you will live too. And on that day, you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. God says, I'm not still deliberating whether or not I'm going to come close to you. No, he says there is no separation. I have committed, decided in the cross of Jesus Christ on Easter, here on Resurrection Sunday, we, we, we can be convinced of the fact that God has said, I am now going to come and make my home in you through the spirit that I've sent and through the death and resurrection of my son. It's almost like those those Russian nesting dolls, you've probably seen them where you, you take one out and then there's the next one in it and you, and you take it out and there's another one and another one and another one. In fact, the, the world record for the, the biggest Russian doll set ever was a 51 piece set. And obviously it was made by a Russian lady. I'm not even going to try and pronounce her name, but it, the, the biggest of these dolls was almost half a meter tall and the smallest one was about a half a centimeter. Now, can you imagine just trying to, to take this 51-piece set Russian doll apart and every time there's more and more and more? God is saying, if you look inwardly and you ask the question, God, in this season where I feel so broken, the world around me is so devastated, are you in there as it were? God says, I have taken up residence in the deepest crevice of your soul. I have been united with you, if you ever feel separated from me, you can walk up to the high hill truth of the fact that I am not near you. I am not even in close proximity or next to you. I am in you through the life, death, and resurrection of my son. God has united himself with us. But the second thing that Paul says we have to wrestle with them is we have to understand that very often the reason why we feel the sense of separation is because the things that we can see around us makes us doubt the things that we cannot see. The things we can see around us, life and our emotions and the brokenness, coronavirus epidemic, lockdown, global recession, the things we can see, it makes us doubt the things that we cannot see. We cannot see God with our physical eyes. And in a moment like this, even Paul, we're going to read here, is in a moment of his life where he's doubting in a sense and he's saying it's so difficult with the circumstances that I'm facing to still believe in and see this God for who he is. Paul writes and he says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And then he says, as it's written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. You see, Paul, as an apostle, as someone chosen by God to help establish the church, he was someone who had everything before he met Christ. He was a man of high standing in, in society. He was a learned man. He was a respected man. He was someone who was deeply ingrained in his culture. And all of that he threw away when Jesus came into his life. On the road to Damascus, Paul met the risen Jesus and his life was changed forever. And he throws away everything of worth in his old life to take up this new life. And he says, you know what? It's not always been easy. Paul has been beaten. He's been deserted. He's been shipwrecked. He's been tossed aside by those that love him. He has been rejected in every single sense that you can imagine. And he says, you know what? At times, I look at all of this and it makes me wonder. I feel a sense of separation. It's so difficult. In fact, he goes and he quotes from Psalm 42. This verse in, in 36 where it says, because of you, we've been put to death. Paul is quoting from, from Psalm 44. And this is a heavy, heavy psalm. He's going to read it. Because Psalm 44 speaks about the fact 
that the nation of Israel is facing incredibly difficult circumstances. They feel almost broken open. But the beautiful thing is, is this psalm, and, and that's actually something you find all over the Old Testament and the Bible, and especially in the Psalms. That's what I love about the book of Psalms, is half of these Psalms are what we call Psalms of lament, of just crying out before God and saying, God, I don't understand. I don't have all the answers. I don't have the full picture. I don't grasp everything that's going on. And in fact, it's making me feel a sense of separation. And it's not a lightweight thing. Then the answer comes, oh, well, just ignore it. You know, just deny your circumstances or your emotions. No, it's pouring out those things before God and God accepts that. He says that should be in the Bible. Paul is doing exactly that. He is pouring out his emotions based on his circumstances. But then, exactly like Psalm 44, there is a moment where it's not getting stuck in or denying emotions and circumstances, but rising above them to a greater truth. The psalmist says this. He says, you are my king, my God, who ordains victory for Jacob, though through you we drive back our foes. Through your name we trample our enemies. I do not trust my bow and my sword does not bring me victory. But you give us victory over our foes. And let those who hate us be disgraced. We boast in God all day long. We will praise your name forever. See, Paul is he's walking in the line of saying, God, it's so viscerally difficult at the moment. The circumstances, the emotions are so real. My job, my emotions, my income being in danger, our country, the world, the, the possible death of someone close to me. God, it's so difficult, but a higher truth emerges that shows us that, yes, we can be honest about our emotions. We can be honest about the circumstances we face at this point, but especially in Easter, we are being taken onto a higher plane, a higher truth, a higher peak. And it's almost repeating. That's why Paul in another moment in his ministry can say exactly that. He's facing the realities, but he's being taken to a higher truth. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8, he says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Paul is saying, if I hold on to the truth of Jesus Christ and his victory and his gospel, yes, life can be tough. Yes, things happen that we don't understand. Yes, my emotions are in tatters at moments because of it. But there is a higher truth that even though my life will never be, be storm-free in Christ, that's an example we see in Paul's life. It can be storm-proofed because of the gospel truth. And how do we do that? How do we get to such a secure hold? How can we imitate Paul's faith in this moment? And I think what he's saying is, we have to truly understand our redemption. We have to be taken up. Redemption is a fancy church word, a, a Bible word that means to, to take back, to redeem something is to, to win it back, to buy it back in a sense. And God says in Jesus, my people have been redeemed. I've taken them back into my fold. If we are going to find ourselves on such secure footing as Paul, as he emerges from emotions and circumstances, we have to come to a place where we are truly taken up in our redemption in Jesus Christ. And to do that, we have to really understand the costliness of our redemption, especially on a day like today, over Easter weekend, to understand how costly our redemption is. If we just go back a couple of verses, when Paul says earlier in our chapter 8, he says in verse 32, he, in other words, God, did not even spare his own son. He did not even spare his own son. If you think about what God had to give in order to redeem us, it, you know, God went to the absolute limits of what he had. God cannot give anything more than Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, becoming a, a person, being born of a woman and actually dying on the cross, this horrific death, and taking 
the, you know, the death and the brokenness and the sin of the world upon himself. This, this phrase of, you know, uh, it's, it's everything and the kitchen sink. That does not even apply to what God did. God gave more than the kitchen sink. He gave of himself. It's so costly. There's a couple that Shane, I know, just an amazing Christian couple, and they would, once a year, they would go through their house and they would decide if there's something that we own that it's become so important to us, it's like a little God in our house, then they just give it away. And they told us this one year, they felt confronted by the fact that their flat screen TV in their house had become like this all-consuming God. And so they took it and gave it away. Can you believe it? That is a costly sacrifice, but it pales infinitely in comparison to what God did. God gave of himself in his son Jesus Christ to redeem us. It's a costly, costly thing. The more that costliness of my redemption takes hold in my heart, I will be able to stand in a world even when it is aflame. And the second thing is, it's not just the costliness of our redemption, but it's the lavishness. It's that God lavishly, freely, abundantly gave to us grace and love and the redemption that we received in Jesus. Paul says he didn't even spare his own son, but what he offered him up for us all. That's amazing. He offered him up for us. That's a lavish thing. There's a South African church leader that I have so much respect for, and he tells the story of in a season where he wanted to understand and teach to those around him the lavish love and grace of God. He took his daughter out to go and buy dresses. And he told her she can only take one. And so they were fitting dresses and she was excited and dancing around in them. And finally she had three dresses lined up and she couldn't choose. And, you know, she was saying this one and it's so difficult. And eventually she said, okay, I'll take that one. And in that moment, her father said, no, I'm going to buy all three of them for you. And she was so taken back. Why? She asked. And he said, he said, because I want you to understand something of the lavishness of God in Jesus Christ. As I lavish you in a small way, God has lavished us in a massive way in Jesus Christ. That's why Ephesians 1 verse 5 and 6 says, it's to the praise of His glorious grace that God has lavished upon us His love in His beloved one, Jesus In Jesus, God has lavished upon us. He's given super abundantly to us so that we would become super conquerors in life, holding on to our redemption. Even when life is falling apart, if I understand the costliness and the lavishness of what Jesus has done, it takes me to a higher place. To finish off, I love Dr. Martin Hilbert. He's at the University of Southern California. And he was part of a study where they showed that every single day, people like us in the modern age in 2020, we are bombarded with the equivalent of 174 newspapers worth of information of news every single day. Can you imagine that? Going to sit in a coffee shop, you would need a proper bottomless coffee to get through 174 newspapers every single day. And yet he says, that is the amount of information, of news that's getting tossed to us through, you know, the radio and our phones and podcasts and information and the internet and and friends. All of this is getting tossed to us. Friends, at Easter, we have to realize that we did not just receive okay news or a bit of No, it's meh news. It's just there. No, we have received the greatest news. It's called the good news, gospel of Jesus that rises above all this information and takes us to a place where even when life completely knocks us down, when everything is broken, when the world is on fire like it is at the moment, And when we feel because of that, or in my personal life, or in my professional life, things have gone so wrong, God, and I, and I, and I have this moment, this sense of separation, then with Paul, I can say, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am persuaded 
that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In this time of Easter, we know that it's not our performance and our track record. It's what Jesus has done, not what we can do, what he has done when he said it's finished. No, and then we can know whatever happens when the reality of opposition or the sting of accusation in our hearts or those feelings of condemnation or today then even that sense of separation, when that comes, we can say, no, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Easter is death to life forever in Christ. Let's pray together. Jesus, I pray this morning as we are just taking in this Easter weekend, God, may you just saturate our hearts with good news. And in a moment in our country where we are feeling just burdened, God, people are feeling a sense of separation maybe, they are doubting, they are struggling with emotions and circumstances. I pray for my own heart. I pray for Dr. Hatfield. I pray for our country. May we find in Jesus alone and nothing else truth and a higher reality. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Every week during this series, we are taking just a moment to pray into a specific theme. And so can I ask us to prepare our hearts? We're going to pray together. Let's pray with faith. Guys, this morning we're gonna spend a few moments just in praying together. And uh, we felt on our hearts this morning that we wanna pray for our families and relationships. Especially in this time, we are challenged. We are locked inside. <laughs> we're staying home. Uh, and I know that sometimes conflicts may arise or something uh, might just wreak havoc in your house. And especially in this time, I think for, for families to stick together and to grow even more deeply into each other's lives. So let's take two minutes this morning, pray for our families, pray for our relationships. You might this morning not be actually with your family. Uh, just take a few moments and pray for them. put our families and our loved ones at your feet and we, we pray for just our relationship uh, between each other Father. I want to pray that you would bless families, bless marriages, uh, bless brothers and sisters this morning. May this time of lockdown actually be a time of tightening down and tightening up our relationships 
and just diving deeper into each other's lives. And we pray that in your name this morning. Amen. Guys, I want to invite you just in a time of worship and response. So stand with us as we worship.
Awesome, guys. Thank you for joining us this morning in just a word, in time of worship and praying together. Uh, we know that this week is going to be a good one for you. Stay safe, guys. Wash your hands. Stay home. We'll see you next week. Cheers.